Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's webinar presentation. This is the fifth webinar of a six-part series, with our final webinar happening next Thursday, May 7th, as part of our Forest Invasive Spring Series. To learn about the rest of the series, please visit www.forestinvasives.ca. My name is David Nisbet, and I'm the coordinator for the Forest Invasives Project at the Invasive Species Centre in Sault Ste. Mary, Ontario. The Invasive Species Centre is a non-profit organization created in 2011. We connect stakeholders, knowledge and technology to prevent and control the spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy and society. We build networks of experts and stakeholders to identify and act on priority invasive species. We provide funding, coordinate and lead projects in natural and applied science, technology transfer, outreach and education. And we consolidate and disseminate information to raise awareness leading to the prevention of harmful invasive species. If you want to learn more about the ISC, you can visit our webpage at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Our speaker today is Dr. Richard Wilson. Richard is a forest pathologist with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Richard provides provincial leadership to the forest health programs, policy, research, and monitoring for both native and non-native species. If you have a question for Richard during the presentation, please enter it into the side panel of the GoToWebinar program, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible with the time remaining at the end of the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Richard, and he will take it from here. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, bonjour tout le monde. It's a real pleasure to be here to uh, speak about invasive forest pathogens. And um, I'm going to start off with a real bang right away, just leading into, into um, uh, looking at some established and emerging diseases as found in Ontario. Is there a way we can just clean the screen up a bit here? Um, just as we're getting started here, we're just going, to, just going to do something technical here. I want you to look at the extreme left-hand side of the screen and look at the diseases. And what we see down there is a long list of diseases that we have in Ontario white pine blister rust, beech bark disease, American chestnut blight. Many of these diseases, as you read down to this list, have been here for a long time, especially if you look over on the right-hand side. But what I'd like you to concentrate on before we get into this presentation is, is to where these diseases, how they've been introduced. So if you look on the extreme right-hand side, you can see infected nursery stock for most of those diseases. The next column over is how long they've been in Ontario. So white pine blister, as you can see, it's been in Ontario for 100 years since last year. Amazing. So we're not going to have time to address all the invasive species that we have, but I'd like to pick a few. And the ones I'd like to address today would be white pine blister, us, beech bark disease, a little bit on butternut canker, and a little bit on oak wilt. If you were hoping to speak or hear me speak about other things, you'll have to catch me another time, but we have limited time. Just trying to advance to the next slide here. Thank you. Um, you should be looking at slide two, the invasive species curve. And what I want to bring your attention here on this slide is if you look along the bottom, the x-axis, it's really just time. If you're looking on the y-axis to the left is the area invested, and on the right is control costs. And along that curve, the black wording on top where it says introduction, detection, land managers, and public awareness. This invasive curve is pretty common for most invasive species, and I'm sure many of you have seen this. But what I want to bring your attention to is some of the invasive species that we're dealing with in Ontario. If we were to address white pine blisterus, something that's been here for 100 years, and where would you place that on this curve? Well, in my mind, it should be on the top right-hand side. You know, we're, we're, we have it pretty well across North America, right across Canada. There are some issue, some areas in the, in the far west where it's not, but in Ontario, we have it everywhere. So this is, is uh, really prominent on control because the costs are really high. And what we really do is local management only. If we address another disease, what we're we talking about today, like beech bark disease, that was really only found in Ontario around 1989. Uh, we, that's when we actually found the organism itself, but we know it's been around for a little bit longer. Where would we put it on this curve? Well, land managers have been aware of it for a little bit of time, 
Um, in fact, certainly our survey and monitoring folks have been aware of it for quite some time, you know, way down before like where the detection is. But where we are really right now, I would say, is way up there above where public awareness typically begins. So the public has only been really aware of beach bark disease in Ontario, I'm going to say probably for the last five to 10 years. And if we look at where we are with that disease, um, it's way up there on that scale. You know, the costs are extra, extra astronomical to control. We have large infested areas, which we're going to see shortly. Um, so the disease, in my mind, is really progress along that curve. And there's little that we're going to be able to do about it. I also want to address oak wilt today. And if we were to look at that, and we're going to talk about oak wilt in a bit, we don't have that in Ontario yet. So it's on the extreme left-hand side of the curve, you know, not even on the curve. So it hasn't been introduced. We don't have it there. And the reason I want to talk about that one disease is that because that's where we can make the biggest difference. Unlike insects, once diseases arrive in any of those lists that we saw before, the white pine blister us, beech bark disease, butternut canker, once we detect them, they're usually quite far along and eradicating them is extremely difficult because we can't see them. It's not as easy as finding an insect, monitoring the insects and, and spraying or other control methods that they use. So in many cases, or in most cases, diseases are extremely difficult to eradicate and preventing the introduction is where we can make the biggest gains. Once they're here at that introduction phase that we see in the lower part of the graph there, yes, it's possible to prevent or maybe eradicate, but most of the time our detection is quite a bit along that curve. And often, we're, as we're gonna see this afternoon, once these diseases become established, even in small localized areas, they're very, very difficult to eradicate and they can spread quite easily by different mechanisms that we're gonna see shortly. Moving on to the next slide, I, I wanna to start to address beech bark disease. Um, so I'm gonna give a little bit of background on each of these diseases just to bring you up to date. So what is beech bark disease? Well, it's an invasive pathogen that's associated with a invasive insect. So we need a scale insect, which is an invasive, and a fungus, which we call Neonectria faginata, which doesn't have a real nice name. Usually we combine both the scale and the disease together and call it beech bark disease or working together in a complex. And also to have beech bark disease, we need beech trees. So it's only beech trees that are infected and it's only beech trees that get this disease, both the native beech and the European beech that's imported. So how did this disease get here? Well, it came into Halifax in 1890 on European beach, horticultural plant material, and it's been spreading westward and southward ever since. And since arriving in Ontario, it's actually been doing quite a bit of damage in about 1989 when we saw it. So what's the epidemiology? How's the infection and spread take place? Well, these little tiny scale insects, which are about the size of a millimeter in size, and you can see one in the center of the screen there, they um, actually feed with a little stylus, much like a mosquito, that they can poke through the very thin bark of beech, beech trees. Beech have extremely thin bark. And by putting the proboscis through and feeding on that bark scale, the inner, the, sorry, the inner part of the bark, they destroy the cambium a little bit. And on the right, you can see the discoloration of where the bark's been removed in the discamium and is, is darkened, and the white material is a healthy material. Those little tiny insects usually produce a nice waxy wool material that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. And when those population, whoops, and when those population numbers uh, jump up um, because they're parthenogenic, which means they can reproduce without sex. So they usually lay about four to seven eggs and they can increase in numbers very, very quickly. The fungus on the next page is, is usually arrives anywhere from two to 12 years after we see the scale insect. So we had the scale arrive first and no disease showing up. And then two to 12 years after the scale is present, we start to see these nice little red, I like to call them eye spots or lemons on their side. These little cankers that are forming just on the surface of the nice smooth bark of the tree usually show up around late August here in Ontario and last pretty well throughout the winter and into the spring. And those lemon shapes you can see on the extreme right-hand side on the lower part where we've taken, cut into one of those spots, you can see that it actually damages the, the cork down into the cambium and just on the surface of the xylem, the wood material. And those fungi grow fairly slowly, but over a period of time, five to six years, they can grow quite fast and they can girdle the tree, uh, certainly girdle the branches, causing them to snap and break off. 
Very, very typical of seeing these little lemon spots on the tree. So how does it spread? Well, the first thing we need is the crawlers. So the crawlers come in, infect those trees, um, multiply rapidly, and those crawlers are moved by wind currents, by birds and insects. I always envision a nuthatch walking up and down an infected tree with a scale on it. It gets onto their feet. They fly to the next tree and they're transporting it. Or even sometimes forest workers like ourselves, researchers, measuring the DBH of those trees and getting them on our sleeves and moving to the next tree. We could be actually moving some of the scale that way from tree to tree. But one of the big ways we figure that these, this disease and complex is moved is through firewood and logs. So with this disease, moving on to the next slide, we, we characterize this disease as having three stages of spread. And the first one I want to address is the advancing front. And the advancing front is characterized by the arrival and the colonization of the insect scale alone. So you can imagine a forest of beech trees with no insects, no scale insects that is, and then eventually one scale insect arrives and it starts producing. And it may have arrived in the wind and it keeps multiplying and multiplying. So that's what we call the advancing front. And here we might find one or two little scale. And if you look very carefully in the top left hand of the photo, you can see some little white specks. I think they look like flakes of dandruff. And sometimes you were looking at trees that only have one or two of these. And our forest health technicians in Ontario would go out and scrape some of these off. If they're seeing very low numbers, send them to the lab and they're identified at the lab. But sometimes the trees, as you can see on the right, have multiple ones and sometimes a single tree can hold millions and millions of them. In fact, this tree here um, is just covered. That's not snow on the side of that tree where that red mid is from that person. That's all millions and millions of scale insects on a heavily infested tree, but not yet showing signs of beech bark disease. The second stage of the spread of the disease is called the killing front. And it's characterized by a very high level of scale infestation. So lots of scale on the, tr on the trees like we just saw on the previous slide, but also lots of fungal canker showing up. So we're starting to see those eye spots showing up on the trees, lots and lots of them. In fact, sometimes the whole trees can be red and you can't find the eye spots because they're all morphed together. And often we'll see at this stage this rapid tree mortality, sometimes greater than 50% occurring within uh, you know, a three to five year period. So here's a tree that's got lots of canker on it. You can see those nice lemon or eye spots and they're fairly separated, so they're distinct. And you can imagine the cambium underneath that tree is being damaged, but it's still functioning and still working. But here on this tree, you can see that they've morphed together. This tree is heavily infected, showing lots of the, um, the sporulation happening. But the tree on the right, which is very close, you might see only a few lemon shapes or the red colors on there. It's not heavily infected. And usually what happens with those trees when they're at that stage where they're very heavily infected and they're losing the cambium. And of course, you can imagine the cambium on the smaller diameter branches the size of your wrist or even your finger are dying first. So we often see flagging in the tops of the trees, smaller diameter leaves because the vascular tissue is being damaged. It's not conducting well. And of course, if it happens at the base of the tree, the tree is girdled and it dies. And one of the things we know about beech, it's subject to many, many other secondary fungi. So once the tree starts to decline a bit, other fungi come in opportunistic and do a lot more damage. How fast does the killing front work? Well, this slide is taken from one of our research plots up in North Rail Lake Road, which for some of you who might know is just north of um, Huntsville. And here we're looking at bigger of the tree. And bigger of a tree, you'll see the numbers across the bottom there, bigger one and two, three, four, and five. Bigger is the health rating of the tree that we use in Ontario, and that's used pretty much for forest health monitoring across North America. So a bigger rating of one to two is a, very, a fairly healthy tree. A bigger rating of three is a moderate tree. Health, not great, not really bad, but not healthy, healthy. And a bigger rating of four and five is very low. A five is a dead tree and a four is a tree that's not very healthy at all and will soon be dead. So back in 2010, and on, and on the x-axis, that's actually a number of trees, this plot contained 67 beech trees in 2010. Some of them were dead, about six or so were dead, and 60 of the trees you can see there in the green were alive. If you look over the period of those four years, from 2010 to 2013, you can see that the green, healthy, bigger one and two trees has dropped dramatically. If you look from the 60 trees that we had 
you know, Vigor 1 and 2 in 2010 to about the 18 trees that we're seeing in 2013. If you look at how the rate increases from 2010 up to 2013, you can see that we dramatically increased the number of mortality or dead trees or trees that are really stressed to about 40, just over 40. So just in this one plot at the killing front, we confirm that we're seeing very rapid mortality in those trees. So how fast is this mortality happening? Well, this is a photo of Kilbear Provincial Park, which is not far, for, for those from Ontario will know, not far from um, the, the site that we just showed you, North Wheel Lake Road, which is also in the killing front in 2012. Uh, here's a tree, a large beech tree that's, that's actually snapped. So one of the things that happen with beech bark disease is once the trees are heavily infected and other secondary fungi come in, the trees become very brittle and, and any wind or even their own weight or lopsidedness can cause them to snap unexpectedly, and we call that term beach snap. So here's a tree falling across one of the major roadways going into the park. Now I should tell you back in 2012, in September, just after the long weekend when the park was still open, uh, this campsite that we're looking at here where a beach snapped and failed because of beach bark disease. And what you see there in the foreground is a picnic table, one of three picnic tables that are buried underneath that rubble of that tree where the day before on the long weekend, a family was having a reunion there and underneath that pile of wood is three picnic tables. That really caused the concern in the park and they removed a lot of trees, about 6,000 cords all in the period of a year and spent $1.4 million doing so. This is a picture of one of the uh, park uh, at the beach actually, it's three, one of three um, parking lots where you can see what that wood pile looked like from just removing from one park and the expense of that $1.4 million in doing that. So what's the third stage of, of the spread of this disease? That's what we call the aftermath zone. It's usually characterized by lower scale populations. So the scale is still present and you can still find it high, but most of the time it's in low populations. We see lots of residual defective and declining trees. Now, most of the trees have died or fallen down, or in any cases, the forest management's going on have been removed. But there are some disease tolerant trees within the, with superficial cankers. So we still see some trees that have cankers that are still surviving. So we don't see total destruction. We don't see total mortality, but we do see a, a rapid decline in the large diameter sized trees. And then we might be able to find a few um, I even questioned the word using the word fully resistant trees, but trees that are expressing some resistance. And in New Brunswick, they found that to be about one to four trees. Other jurisdictions are finding one to four percent of trees, I should say. And other jurisdictions are finding somewhere from one to six trees. So what would that look like in the aftermath forest? Well, here's a tree that's showing some kind of tolerance. It has some canker on it, and those cankers are being walled off. You can see those bumps by the cambium trying to overcome going over the necrotic material. And those trees in the aftermath forest are often very poor shaped. So here's an example, one with a little bit of a crown. It's dying back slowly, but didn't die. And, and you know we don't really know how long it's taken this tree to get to the stage. But in the aftermath forest, we see a general decline of the beech trees for a period of time. Looking at a, a map of showing the beech bark disease in Ontario, and this map isn't our most up-to-date map, but I like this one because it shows uh, a bit more information than what we have on our map that we normally show right at the present time. So looking at this map, we're seeing uh, beech bark disease represented by the red, red dots on the screen. And where the scale has been found only as the square blue dots. And um, the light, the dark brown in the middle there is where we surveyed for the disease in 2004. So 2004, that dark brown center part we're looking at, along the edge of that, where it joins into the next lighter brown or olive green color, is where the advancing front was in 2004. So that's where the trees were, I should say the killing front was, where the trees were dying fairly rapidly. In 2000, since 2004 to 2012, we've been monitoring, of course, continuously. And the new boundary with that in 2012 is where the olive green meets the light green. And you can see that it's advanced quite quickly. In a matter of eight years, it's moved roughly that distance. And as I said, usually we see the scale insect move first, so two to 12 years, and then we see the disease. 
So our advancing front is somewhere along those lines of between the olive green and the dark green. And the range of beach in Ontario just goes up to that lake that's pretty well in the center of the screen, just under, underneath the word bark there. Uh, that's pretty much the range up by North Bay. And it continues along to the red square of this, you know, the small insert there where it says Ontario to what we call St. Joseph's Island, where you see a couple of blue dots. And just last summer, we discovered beach bark disease there recently. So it's, that's the range of beach. And you can see where the disease has, has approached, um, has moved quite quickly in just a matter of eight years in Ontario. The uh, little P dots in there just represent research plots where we tried to put some of those plots in advance of the advancing front and the killing front, and uh, we've been overwhelmed. So if you were looking at those photos that we just showed you of Kilbear Provincial Park, that's the P in Georgian Bay, if you know where Lake Huron is, just below that little lake under Bark. That first P closest to the Great Lakes is where Kilbear Provincial Park is. And the other P to the right of that is where I was showing you the um, Huntsville, where we show North Rail Lake Road, where we're seeing very rapid mortality of beach. So we're seeing beach die, but one of the things that we are noticing is that, and, and other folks have noticed, is that there is some resistance and tolerance. And we need to define these two terms to, to really work with them. So the first one, when we say a, a, the tr a tree is resistant to beach bark disease, it's being defined as resistant to the scale insect. So if a tree doesn't get the scaled insect, no scaled insect, it can't get the disease. So if no scale is present on that tree, it's not going to get the disease. And it's pretty hard to determine that while the disease is advancing in that advancing front. So the scale is coming in, you see some trees without. Is it because they haven't got the scale yet? Are they getting the scale? But in certain locations or jurisdictions like New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and, and upstate New York, where they've had the disease for many, many years, if you walk through those stands of trees and you look for the trees that are smooth bark, then you can usually find anywhere from one to 4%. And what, that's what we call those trees exhibiting resistance. And those are the trees that we think will be the future trees that will be in the forest. So even though it, we're seeing a lot of devastation, there is some resistance being shown in the species of beech. And part of our jobs are to make sure we get those and make sure they're not cut and that we're using those as genetic source to build up the, the, you know, our forest or stands of beech trees in the future. And hopefully that will work. The term tolerance is defined as the ability of a tree to limit the impact of the fungus to infect it. And that's usually done by the tree trying to stop the radial and lateral spread by means of chemical or callus barriers. So there might be something in the bark of the tree that's slowing down the spread of that fungus within the tree, or it might be the callus barriers along with the chemical aspects of the tree trying to wall off and stop those trees from spreading. So looking at resistance, here's a photo of two, two large beech trees in Ontario, and usually it's the larger trees that we see are attacked and, and disappear fairly quickly. The tree on the left, you can see, looks fairly smooth bark. Uh, there is no beech bark disease on that tree on the left. But the tree on the right, if you look very carefully, you'll see lots of those lemon shapes or eye shapes morphing together. And it doesn't quite look right. And if you could zoom in on that, you can see that it's loaded with beech bark disease, the actual fungus. So why is the tree on the left so uh, not infected and the tree on the right infected? Is that tree showing resistance? So I want you to think about that because when we come back talking about the management, if you were to mark this tree or walk through the stand, you'd want to take out the tree that's diseased and make sure you note where the tree is that's not showing any signs of the disease or scale and keep that for the future forest. Here's a tree showing some tolerance. So this tree has been infected. You can see those lemon shapes of, of the tree has tried to wall it over with the cambium layer. And you'll see that there are little patches where there's little star shapes, I call them, or little necrotic spots, or sometimes a little oozing, that might mean that an infection has gotten into that tree and over a period of a number of years, because we know there's about 60 or so species of secondary fungi that attack beech and um, rot it very quickly, and that's what makes it such a beautiful wildlife tree. And also, it's also one of the reasons that, um, you know, beech isn't really well, hasn't been well looked after because of this disease in the past. A lot of maritime foresters call it the God's gift to, to foresters for not having to use marking paint because they don't have to worry this tree is just removed automatically. Not a good thing. And in some aspects in the States, they call it uh, biocontrol for sugar maple and yellow birch because people didn't really have a high value of for beech. 
But in Ontario, we have uh, something called the Biodiversity Act, and biodiversity is important to us in Ontario, and these trees and all tree species are important. So we're trying to manage this disease to keep them on the landscape. So just that leads us into looking at some best management practices for dealing with beech bark disease. So looking at the advancing front, that's where we may not have the scale insect yet, or we're seeing the scale insect only, but no disease. And we know it takes anywhere from two to 12 years, according to the literature and depending on where you are, before you start to see the fungus come in, the killing happening. So at that stage, it's a good opportunity. And since we know where this disease is in Ontario, and we know it's advancing quite quickly, it gives forest managers time to go into those stands of trees and remove some of that biomass that they have before they lose it, but also to do that so that they can manage the next generation of trees coming up. So if you can imagine if you had a beech stand that had 50% beech, so if every, you know, one, every second tree is a beech tree, and all of a sudden you're worried about beech bark disease coming in, and you know if you remove all those beech trees, you're gonna get a lot of other things coming up, but they may not be species that you want, that you can't control, how can you manage that? So by knowing that the disease is coming, and if you have enough time, then you can turn around and start to take out some of those beech and, and plan for what's coming, a killing front. But what can you be doing in the interim? Well, you could look at the bottom of the screen there where it says retain resistant trees with no scale or low level of scale among heavily infested trees. So if you're managing your woodlot on a regular basis, you could go in there and saying, hey, I'm seeing scale on these trees, but not these trees. Then you certainly might want to mark the trees that you're seeing no scale on and try to keep those, but it doesn't mean for sure that they're not gonna get scale in the future and, and succumb, but it's something you can do. On the killing front, where the trees are dying very rapidly, so we're seeing rapid mortality, you know, 50% or more in a short period of time, and that really depends on you monitoring this, of course, being out there in your woodlot, or for our forest health techs, being out there and saying, okay, the advancing front is here now, we're seeing this rapid mortality. Their best management practice is, would probably result in trying to remove those damaged trees, the trees that are dying, try to salvage those. But also in the case of the parks, you might want to remove those trees before they fall down on your clients and you have liability issues. Again, one of the things you're going to do is look at the bottom of the screen. Make sure you keep those resistant trees. You're looking for trees with no scale, low level of scale among the trees that are heavily infested, and also for the trees that don't have any neonectria, any of the fruiting bodies of the fungus on them. And I'm giving a really abbreviation of this. There's a few other things that one can do, but it, it, it's, uh, you should look this up if you're looking for more detail. And the finally, in the aftermath zone, so this is where the killing front has gone through. We've seen rapid mortality. A lot of the big beach are gone. And now we're in the aftermath forest. We're there with what's left. And very slowly, that those larger trees, the ones that have infection, will, will die. And some of them, depending on their vigor, so how healthy they were and where they're located and, and just luck of the draw, might take a little longer to die. So we're not going to lose all the beach in the landscape, but what we're going to do is lose those large beach. So in the Maritimes, you don't see large beach as we do here in Ontario. And eventually our forest is going to transition to smaller diameter beach that will become much more gnarly and, um, and then succumb once they get to a size. So I'm saying about 10 inches is something that's fairly large that you don't see too much, much larger than that in New Brunswick. Um, the other aspect of the aftermath forest, this is, in my mind, is the best place to look for resistant trees. So in Ontario, we're not quite there yet. You know, we can certainly put some energy in looking at resistant trees, but places like New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and upstate New York, where they've had the disease for a long period of time, and walking through that aftermath forest, it's quite a bit easier to find those trees and to spend resources in looking for those trees at that time. Um, the next piece I want to jump into uh, with a little bit of detail is white pine blister rust. White pine blister rust is a very important um, disease for us in Ontario and North America. It's certainly um, a concern out west where it's relatively new in some aspects in some of the five needle pines. I should say that white pine blister rust only infects five needle pines, so not red pines and spot, scott pine or pinus contorta, the five needle pine family, and it's associated with an alternate host. So I'm not going to go through this life cycle here, but I just wanted to put the slide up to show you that, for those who are not familiar, that white pine has a five, is a five-cycle rust, and its alternate host, besides being on pine trees, is on ribe species, which includes goose, gooseberry plants and currants. And 
if we want to end this disease, it would be really simple. We could just destroy all the gooseberries, and people have tried to do that in the wild forest, but they weren't able to do it. But if we got rid of the gooseberries, then we wouldn't have white pine blister rust, or gooseberry and currant growers would probably like it if we got rid of the five needle pines, then they wouldn't have any problems with trying to grow gooseberries or currants. So it really depends on these two species of habit. So basically what happens is we have some spores that come from an infected ribes plant or a gooseberry currant plant. It lands on one of these needles and you can see these little spots. We know that these spots are accurate because these came from a, a laboratory infected tree at the Ontario Forest uh, Research Center, OFRI. And those little spots get infected, the needle gets infected and it works its way back. So here we see a photo of a, a small tree that's got an infected needle. That needle's infection has worked its way back to the, in this case, the main bowl, or it could be a branch of the tree. And hopefully your photo is showing up nicely there on your screen that you can just see a little bit of discoloration around that needle where it attaches to the, the bowl of the, that stem of the tree. And you see that discoloration. Over a period of time, um, that infection works its way and you can see some discoloration. Sometimes the needles hang on for a little bit of time. And there you see some little tiny droplets. This is about a year later and this is a pycnidia or pycnidia spores forming on that tree or stem or branch. And the next year, usually two years later, that branch starts to swell. And here you can see the example, it sort of looks a bit like a spindle. It's a little bit broader in, in the middle there. And as I said, sometimes the needles will hang on for a little bit of time. And if you're careful and you're looking, you can see that. And those needles are those that will expand a little bit. In this case, the seedling, which is in a nursery setting, you can see that these spores are forming called ascospores, and they're pretty well girdled that tree. And if you look, that tree still has some healthy looking needles. So it hasn't really girdled around that stem completely, but next year or maybe the next year, that tree will be dead. So it takes about two years to get to this stage. And what actually kills the tree is when it, the fungus reaches the main stem as it has here on this little tree, it girdles it, kills the vascular tissue and the tree dies. So here's a larger diameter tree on about a 10 year old tree. You can see these yellow pustules are actually beautiful. If you're in Ontario or in Eastern Canada about this time of the year, uh, right now um, is a perfect time in Sault Ste. Marie to see this. It usually happens for about a three week period most people uh, who aren't out and about in the forest because there is still snow wells around here, so there's still snow and we can see this. It doesn't last very long, so often people miss this. And this is probably one of the main diagnostic features that people use to identify, identify blister rust in the field. And once those yellow spores, or they're sometimes even orangier than what this photo is showing, disappear, you just get this ruffled kind of barky material at the bottom of the screen, you're seeing that a bit. and um, Sometimes people have difficulty at seeing that. But once you've got an eye for it and you're out there in the field, you can pick it up quite easily. Here are three um, about eight-year-old pine trees sitting in front of us. And the tree on the right, you can see, is dead. It's pretty obvious. It's died from white pine blister rust. If we were to go up to that tree and look at the base of the tree, we'd find those pustules at this time of the year. But you'll see scarring on that tree. And you would notice that there's something not quite right about the bark of that tree certainly at the base of that tree below the lowest whorl of branches. If we look at the tree right in the middle of the screen, you can see it's off color compared to the one on the extreme left. It's a little bit yellower in color. And again, if you were to walk up to the base of that tree and look at in the base there by the lowest whorl of, of, of uh, branches there, it also has blister rust, but it just hasn't died yet. Blister rust isn't really quick acting, it can take it takes usually about two to three years to develop, so we see those pustules. Those pustules will return every year on that tree in the same location, as long as that tree is alive. Once the tree dies, it doesn't show up. Um, but if we had a pustule or those sporulations on one of those branches, and it wasn't at the main bowl of the tree, then all we'd see is a branch of that tree flagging, and um, the tree would be fine for a while until it, it grew down that branch and into the main bowl, and it could take some time. So sometimes these trees I've seen hang on for 10, 15 years before they actually die or get to the bowl of the tree and cause that tree to die. The third tree that we see, the furthest to the left, is green. That's a healthy tree, and that tree had no blister rust on it. So in this case, you know, out of three trees, two of them had it, and it's just showing you uh, the different stages that time. So in Ontario, and, and other provinces have this as well, uh, we have zones where we predict the hazard rating or we try to predict uh, where it's 
this disease is most uh, susceptible in the areas across the province. And this was done in 1985 by Henry Gross, longtime CFS, Canadian Forestry Service researcher. And here we're looking at the hazard zone. So if you see the light yellow, it's a low hazard rating. And the, the orangey or the darkest color we have at the top to the north is a very hazard rating. So that gives us some indication of where we can plant trees. Now, this one is very crude, and we've always hoped in Ontario that we'd be able to improve this. But we've been waiting for the province of Quebec to do it, and they have been. In fact, they're using state-of-the-art technology and GIS information, which I'm not going to go into detail here. But they're developing a much more risk-based map than what we have here, this crude one, and using some of the features I'm going to talk about next. So with white pine blister rust, we, there are some things that we can do to control it silviculturally. There is no magic bullet for beech bark disease, which I failed to say. There's no chemical treatment, no spray. And white pine blister rust is exactly the same. There's no spray, no chemical treatment, nothing we can do. But what we can do is use silviculture. And silviculture can help us in several ways. The first thing we can look at is the topography. Where are we planting and growing these trees? And if you look at the little diagram there, those trees I have on the hill, we know it's less risky for blister rust to have them planted at the top of a tree or in the middle of a slope. So if you're looking at that slide there, it's good anywhere those trees are, but as we go down the lower part of the slope, we know it's much more risky. That's because um, heavy, dense, cool air that's in fog and mist is carried down and the relative humidity stays down there more on the upper parts of the slopes of hills. Um, and then one exception is that is if you're close to some lakes and it really depends on the wind patterns, it's less risky at the top, more risky at the bottom. The other aspect that we can use is aspect of where those trees are growing, how are they facing? So the best aspect to avoid blister rust is having them self facing and southwest facing. So they get lots of solar radiation and that dries out the morning dews and mists because what we need to get blister rust, which I didn't say, is 48 hours of 100% relative humidity. So if it rains for two days and the spore lands on one of those needles and the conditions are all right, it could potentially get blister rust disease. So self and southwest facing are low risk. North facing and northeast facing are higher risk. So when forest managers or people are planting trees, they, take that, they can take that into consideration and certainly forest managers in Ontario do. The other aspect is ground vegetation. In ground vegetation, I mentioned that we have concern about ribes, and we have ribes all throughout Ontario. In fact, we have about seven species that grow through our forest. And actually, we've been cultivating ribes because it really likes disturbed sites. So any forest management that we're doing, disturbing the soil, ribes are carried in by birds and other methods. They spread and do very, very well in those situations. So if you want to avoid blister rust, don't plant where there's lots of ribes or use some of these other things. The other aspect is less risk if there's no ribes, more risk if there's ribes. The other aspects with ground vegetation is, concer is concerning how much ground vegetation is there. Are you, are there. Do you have trees in lots of ericaceous areas where there's lots of shrubs and even bracken fern that can grow you know, two meters high? And what we want there is if there's lots of shrub vegetation, then it's a higher risk than if it's more open and no vegetation because that allows better air circulation and for that site to dry out. So if you can open it up or control the vegetation, you can control the amount of risk that you have from getting blister rust. Another one that we can use is canopy. And we know that canopy cover, so planting underneath the canopy of existing trees, and white pine is quite tolerant, we can do this, and we do this a lot now in Ontario. It's, to, it's less risky to do that than to plant open areas. And we know it's also less risky to plant from anywhere from 40 to 60% openness. So we can use canopy to help us with our silviculture in controlling white pine blister stress. And the last thing that we can use is moisture. We know that sandy, coarse sandy soils are not are, are better, so that less risk of getting blister rust because those so soils dry out quicker. But if we're dealing with moist soils like clay soils and uh, heavy loams and loamy soils, they're at a higher risk. So taking these five uh, features into place and, and utilizing them all together, so using all five of those bits of information, we can really control the amount of risk that we're subjecting our plantations to using silviculture and planting. And one of the neat things that Quebec is doing is they're using this information, all this information, and trying to do it on a site-by-site, -site, much more refined basis of rather than just saying Northern Ontario is a high risk and Southern Ontario is at a lower risk.
The other aspect that we can use to control white, prune, uh, white pine blister rust is pruning. And pruning off active infections or branches at risk. So most of the time where we're concerned about white pine blister rust is probably the lower two meters of the tree. So where there's ground vegetation, where there's poor air movement, uh, where there's a frost pocket. So if we can prune those lower branches off, even if you don't have the disease, and have better air, cir air circulation, there's a less likelihood that you're going to get infection to take place. Because remember, this disease needs relative humidity of about 100% and uh, about 48 hours. So if we can open up that lower part of the canopy, we can reduce those infections. Now, we can get infections higher up on the trees, but lower down is where we see most of them and we're seeing a lot of mortality. And the other aspect is you can actually prune off the infections on the branches. So if you have an infection on the main stem of the tree or the main bowl, once it's there, there's nothing you can do about that. That tree has a disease and might take a few years to die, but there's nothing you can do. But if it's on a branch that's coming into the main bowl, and I know this is hard um, to think about, but if it's 10 centimeters from the main bowl or four inches, if you like that old system, from the main bowl of the tree on a branch, if you prune off that branch, then you might prevent that infection from the branch from entering the tree. Now, if the infection on the branch is way, way out there, like three feet out, then that branch will probably die where the infection is and it will never make its way back to the bowl. But we still suggest that the pruning of those branches so that it doesn't, you know, it gets rid of the opportunity of other infections to take place. And the last thing I think that I've talked about already is good vegetation management will reduce relative humidity and increase airflow around the lower branches. So that airflow down there is really crucial. That's why planting them at the upper slopes or the mid slopes and not the toe of the slopes of the hills to do that. Um, oh, here's an example of a, a branch infection that uh, unfortunately I don't show you the bowl on the left-hand side of the tree, but if that was four centimeters or four inches, I should say, or less than or greater than 10 centimeters, if you prune that off, that infection would not make it back to the bowl of the tree or, and kill that tree. Now, the other interesting thing about this branch infection here you notice that it's sporulating, and so it's it's the springtime. It's probably around June here, uh, May, June. And if you look at the branches that are to the distal end to the right, they're still green. They look really healthy. So that infection, even though it's very large and it looks pretty fun looking, interesting, isn't that beautiful? Some people hate these things, especially if you're a forest manager. But um, that hasn't killed that branch yet. It's going to die. But it doesn't, it takes time. So if you were looking for this, that's why it's really important to look inside, move those branches away from your younger trees to look to see if they're infected. Some people just go out there looking for dead or, or brown branches and then look for these. But to be really proactive, you have to move the branches aside and look for these small cankers to find them and to prune them off the tree. Uh, this is a colleague's property of mine who, who prunes fairly regularly. He's down in the Cornwall area. Uh, Cornwall is not a high incidence of, of white pine blisterus, if you recall, but he's concerned about trying to have high value trees. And in this case, he's gone in and pruned over many years. Normally, it's only really important to prune maybe the first meter or so, or even two meters. And people can go in there at different stages. So when the trees are only a meter high, you might just take off the lower whorl or two or, or much more. In this case, with this property, he was concerned about blisterus and there was blisterus in the property, but he wanted to produce a higher value log with fewer knots. And he's gone in and now this this photo is fairly old now but these trees have been pruned up to about 18 feet to produce high value white pine logs okay jumping away from white pine blister rust very briefly i want to talk about butternut canker uh, butternut canker is a, a very very serious disease in ontario it's throughout the range of butternut in ontario it was first discovered in ontario around 1991 um, when we first detected the actual fungus but we know from aging those cankers, that was work that the Canadian Forest Service did here in Sault Ste. Marie. When they aged those cankers in 1991, they knew it dropped back to about 1973. So even though we didn't detect it, if you remember that curve, you know, we weren't really quick on the detection of that one. Um, but when we did detect it, we were able to work back from the canker ring analysis that it had been here for quite some time. This tree is actually found on um, an experimental farm in Ottawa. I, I know this tree well. I watched it die over a period of five years. If you're familiar with the Ottawa, this is right near the experimental, um, the neat bee building, the back end of the neat bee building. And this tree, in my mind, is, is, is it's a goner. It's been removed uh, a number of years ago. It's only showing epicormic branching. So that's the little green tufts 
the last stab this tree had. It has lots of cankers on it. And this tree is a really characteristic of some of the control measures that people are experimenting with today, which I think have, don't have great value. And that's trying to open up the area around the tree. So this tree was grown on the lawn. It has a couple of shrubs in front of it. It had plenty of water coming off that roof. I, I estimate it probably in its, you know, it's probably 80 years old or thereabouts. Uh, we know butternut has a short lifespan of about 75 years on average, but we do have trees that live to 100 or more. And there is a bit of a parking lot in one corner of that photo that you see there by that little door. Um, but I don't think that had any influence on that tree's mortality or death. I think it, and what's killing butternut is the butternut canker disease, 100% disease. It's not loss of habitat. It's not anything else. It's, we have lots of butternut still in Ontario. They're in great decline, but it's this disease that's killing this. And I should say that butternut is an endangered species in Canada. It's really only found in three provinces, Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick. And just recently, it's through the range in New Brunswick. But the demise of this tree and why it's an endangered species is because of this fungus. Here's the um, a map of showing of Ontario. The red dots are where we have some research plots put in that we've been following since uh, 19, uh, 2008. And the red line, the red squiggly line, is just showing you where the shield is and where butternut is found. So butternut's not found above that squiggly line into that lighter yellow color. It, you can find it in North Bay and Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie and Thunder Bay and, and even in Winnipeg and other places. And it also has the canker in all those places as well. So it's pretty well through the range of butternut in Ontario and, and pretty well through North America now. What do those trees look like that we have in Ontario that have butternut canker? Well, these are trees that are fairly far gone. Um, the, vigor, the trees at the top of the slide are vigor ratings four. So four is not a very healthy tree. In fact, when we're following many of these trees, you know, if we were to come back, they're just showing epicormics and the next year they would be dead. But since they still have tufts on them, we still classify them as a four until they're dead, dead. The tree, the lower trees in the bottom would probably be classified as threes, if threes. And um, so our, and you can see that the one on the left there is an open grown tree in a park situation. There's all those are butternut. Those trees are all gone. Even in open growing situations where the lawns are mowed, there's no vegetation concerns. Those trees are, are really dire straits. Uh, it gets its name butternut canker because it forms these nice cankers, which are really easy to recognize during the growing season and even without. Um, this, if you look on the right-hand side, you can see the black oozing um, coming out of those fresh cankers. So during the growing season, they ooze this black slimy material. Um, it's because the cambium underneath the tree has died or, and dead, and it's still trying to wash that stuff out. And then the, some of the older cankers, so you can see one in the top, left-hand corner there. That's one that the tree has had a little bit of vigor and it's tried to wall it off. So, you know, if trees of great vigor can sometimes wall off the infection, but they're not able to stop it. This is an invasive species and it eventually will kill the tree. And the lower photo on the left-hand side is just showing you a, a newer canker. Sometimes they have a little white tinge just after the black oozing material goes away and a split. And if we were to remove that bark from that tree, we would see a canker. So the disease, the butternut canker is doing a lot to those trees, but it's not really doing the coup de gras in many cases. So often we'll see the trees with lots of butternut canker. And from our survey in 2008, we know that many of those trees that were in severe decline, so those uh, you know, threes and four bigger ratings, also had lots of secondary problems like armillary or root rot. So up in the top right-hand corner, or I should say left-hand corner, is a photo where you can see lots of mushrooms. That's armillaria root rot. Those mushrooms are edible at the right time of the year. I don't recommend you eating them unless you know what you're picking. And if you look at the photo on the bottom right, those are some rhizomorphs. So we're finding those on the roots. And so a lot of those trees that are stressed from butternut canker really have other pathogens jumping on them fairly quickly and um, making them go downhill even quicker. And on the bottom left is um, Phalanus conchs. So lots of secondary fungi that are coming in on these trees at the same time. Now, another real issue with butternut is, is um, hybridization. And here is the world's largest butternut tree claimed in 2004 by the Royal Ottawa Golf Course. And the Royal Ottawa Golf Course is not really in Ottawa, it's across the river in Hall, Quebec. And I remember looking at this tree in 2003 uh, because it was, in, it was having some real health concerns then. It has some canker on it. And this tree, um, I remember meeting with these folks because they were so concerned about this tree. 
And I said, wow, this is a massive tree. And there were some other folks there from Ontario and they were saying, yeah, this is probably the largest butternut tree they ever saw. And I said, well, there's one in New Brunswick that I know of. And when I go back this summer, I'll check it. And of course um, I did, and, and this tree was larger. But these folks in 2004 put this sign up. And if you look at it, it's 1. Uh, 2.1 meters in diameter. The tree is gone, long gone now. But interesting thing was when they put this up, we weren't sure if this was a really a pure butternut, but they put the sign up anyhow. But back in our lab at Ofri, Glenna, who works in the lab and the, uh, the Ontario Forest Research Lab, and we were doing some work with um, hybridization. So we have a, another species, a, another exotic, or invasive maybe, Japanese walnut, which hybridizes with our, our, our are native butternut. And butter, pure butternut are protected, but hybrids are not. So some of the work that Glenna and Sylvia Grafenhagen were working on, um, were able to determine that that tree that I just showed you, the largest butternut tree in the world, was not a butternut. <laughs> it was actually a hybrid. And uh, those folks weren't happy about that, but the tree didn't last very long. But it really leads to the point that we do have hybridization taking place in Ontario, and those hybrid trees are showing some putative resistance. Now that tree that died at the Ottawa Golf, uh, the Royal Ottawa Golf Course, actually died from butternut canker, and some of those trees are showing some um, putative resistance, but not fully. So there's a whole movement afoot in Ontario to try to to protect by uh, gathering up those trees that are putatively resistant, trying to collect some of that genetic material and grafting it onto other rootstock, and making sure that we have those planted out, so that if we do find a magic bullet or we find some trees that are resistant we'll have enough of the gene stock to do that. And this is some of the work that's going on over at the Ontario Forest Research Institute. So on the right-hand side, you see some grafting going on where they're cutting a twig. And on the left-hand side of that, those, those nice little green seedlings up there, they've, um, they've been successfully grafted. And some of those will be planted out in the Arboretum, but some of them will go under undergo some testing to see how resistant they are. So on the bottom left-hand side, you can see a, tree, uh, a small, um, seedling there being poked with a couple of needles and on the right hand side being inoculated with the pathogen. So not a lot of work going on, but a little bit of work just keeping it going to see if we can find some resistance in, in some of these trees that we're looking at. Uh, one of the things I think is really important that we're not focusing on in Ontario that we should be thinking about and with all these kind of diseases that we're dealing about, here we have hybridization happening naturally in the environment and we're not, in my mind, we're not capitalizing on that. Are these hybrids truly resistant? And we know that they're not. And we should be protecting these, or not protecting them in the sense of an endangered species, but protecting them and working with them. Because in the case of, of American chestnut and Dutch elm disease, we're actually looking at crossing, doing hybridization with other species to try to keep them around. So even if they're a hybrid and they're not pure, we want them around. But in this case, I think we've been spending a lot of energy on trying to protect pure butternut and not working with the valuable gene source that we have with these hybrids. Uh, moving along to oak wilt, uh, we do not have oak wilt in Canada. We do not have oak wilt in Ontario. And oak wilt is a, a, a new emerging disease that's becoming quite rampant in the United States. And the disease is spread by an insect. So it's an insect vector partly. So uh, native uh, beetles will be attracted to a fungus, and I'll explain that a bit more in the tree that's that's infected with oak wilt and spread. But oak wilt can also spread to the root system of infected trees. In this photo here, if you can make out in the center, you see some grayish trees uh, with no leaves. Those trees are dead. And then you can see some brown ones radiating out and going up to the, to the left. Um, those trees are, are infected through root systems. So basically what's happening is the tree becomes infected and through the root system, this fungus is spread from tree to tree and it can spread quite quickly. And once you have oak wilt there, it's very, very difficult to get rid of. And secondly, you have all these trees that are infected, which are gonna be more vectors for insects. And of course, we're always concerned of not just the vectoring by insects, but the vectoring by folks who would be coming in here collecting this firewood and moving it to other fields, not knowing what's actually happened to those trees and why it's bad to do that. Here we have an example of a, a, an oak tree. These, these photos are all from Michigan. As I said, we don't have our, our oak wilt in Ontario or Canada anywhere. So this tree, usually what happens with oak wilt is the leaves wilt. <laughs> That's how it gets its name. So the fungus is a vascular fungus. It gets into the vascular tissue of the tree. It, it, it alters the conduction or it limits the ability of the tree to conduct water. 
So often we'll see the leaves wilting at the top of the crown of the tree, maybe only in a branch or two, and work its way down the tree. So in this case, this tree is heavily infected, and you can see there's some little bits of green left, but it's lost most of its leaves, and they would have been wilting. And often they turn a bronze, not often, but they do turn a bronze color. And sometimes, like you're seeing on the leaf on the top right-hand side, it's um, sometimes they're all a, brown, a bronzy brown, and that color there isn't really justice. It's a little bit redder than that, or it can be. But often the leaf is half and half, so half green, half brown, or bronzy color, and they're always on the ground. Uh, the photo here doesn't do it justice because this must be a tidy landowner who's removed them. But one of the key uh, symptoms of the disease is that you'll see the oak leaves on the ground in June and July, well before the fall season and even into August. So if you're seeing that, uh, the tree shedding its leaves early when everybody else has their leaves still green and it's not anywhere near the fall, then it's a, probably a good symptom that it's oak wilt. And another, besides looking at the leaves and the change of color, and the wilting of the leaves, which only happens for a short period of time. If you look at the twig, because it's a vascular disease, it can actually be picked up quite easily. So if you look at the twig on the right-hand side, you know, that slice through it, you can see some staining. That's not normal. Uh, you see that in, in dealing with Dutch elm disease as well. And it's a really good diagnostic tool. And on the twig on the left side, uh, where the bark's been scraped off a little bit, you can see the, the staining again of the vascular tissue. So that's a really good indicator that you've got oak wilt and um, there's something wrong. The best way to look at oak wilt, so we have oak wilt come in and that tree has lost its, its leaves and we can see those colored leaves on the ground. A year later, often what happens is the bark starts to crack. So here we're looking at a bowl of a tree and you might be able to make out in the center of that photo a nice spine crack that goes almost right down the center of that photo. And if we were to remove that photo, I mean, remove that uh, bark from that tree, and if you look on the left-hand side, you can see around that red square where we took the bark off, different tree, but same idea. You can see a little bit of a dark patch and a little bit of a white. That's where a pressure pad was. So what happened is this tree has oak wilt and it takes about a year for this fungal mat to produce. And the photo on the right side is showing you that fungal mat. It's gray, nondescript. You can actually see two fairly large pads there. Um, sometimes it leaves that block stain that we see on the on the photo on the left. Um, and that fungal mat, which actually is raised, it's quite thick. It actually pushes the bark out and that's what cracks it. And unless you pull the bark off like we've done here, you won't even know that's there. But little tiny beetle insects do, and they're attracted to that fungal mat. They like eating it. And of course, they walk through it, they eat it, they get it on their bodies, they fly away to the next tree and they can spread that fungus. Uh, the fungus is also spread because it's going through the root system, so it works its way down. We'll go from that tree that dies fairly quickly into the next live tree and into the next live tree. Now, one of the nice things about this disease, it doesn't stay with the tree, meaning it, the fungus doesn't exist a long time. It needs life material to survive. So it can spread through the root system, but um, it is limited in spreading above. But the concern that we have is if you didn't remove that bark and know there was a pressure pad there and you have insects that are feeding there, if you're removing this tree for firewood or lumber or whatever purpose, you could be transporting these pressure pads to a new location and having new, fun, uh, new insects come in or having the insects come in here and fly away and move elsewhere. So there's a real concern about spreading oak wilt uh, around several ways. Um, the other aspect of spreading oak wilt is, is by pruning trees. And um, this is something that, that is really, really big in areas where they have oak wilt is most jurisdictions have pruning bylaws are not allowing people to prune or very strongly suggested best management practices not to prune or otherwise harm oak trees during bud swell. So that's when the buds are swelling right about this time of the year in Ontario to about two to three weeks after full leaf development. So in Ontario, that would probably be, be about April 15th to right, you know, that's right about now till July 15th. And the reason that they don't like people pruning trees or it's not a good idea to prune trees during that time is if you prune a tree, then the sap starts to flow and the insects, these beetles are attracted to these trees that have that sap flowing, the odor, the carry moans, the, the smell of the trees attracting those insects. And those trees may not have oak wilt, but the beetles that are being brought in that fly in to find those trees will or might have oak wilt. So certainly in oak wilt infested areas, 
if you know you have oak wilt, then it's not a good idea to prune. And it's probably not a good idea to prune um, if oak wilt is anywhere near you uh, because you, your chances of getting it are, are quite a bit more. And the other aspect in prevention and management in this case is not to move infected wood, that means logs and firewood. And one can't emphasize this enough. Um, I know we, we think about this for emerald ash borer in Ontario and, and a lot of the insect species, but really we should be doing this for all species. In fact, the movement of firewood, I think for years, even before we got concerned about insect pests, we've been spreading pathogens in Ontario, Dutch elm disease, oak, uh, not oak wilt, but uh, white pine blisteress, the whole works by moving trees around um, and, and wood around that's infected with many of these pathogens. So how do we address uh, oak wilt if we do have it? We don't have this again in Ontario, but one of the ways to control the spread of the disease a bit is to use something like this vibratory plow. And this is just a large blade that sticks about, uh, oak roots generally are down about four feet, uh, but this blade can six, stick down into the ground six feet and it's just pulled along the ground and rips the roots and it separates the roots of oak trees from from oak trees so as you can imagine it's severing the roots between trees and as i said when oak wilt transfers from tree to tree it needs live trees to do that so by the time those roots that are severed die and the disease from an infected pocket gets to that area um, the chance of it spreading across are fairly limited because usually there's some guidelines of doing this um, you know x meters before the next live tree so there are methods of controlling the root spread of this disease, but extremely expensive, extremely hard to do in a forest situation, which is being done in states of Michigan and other states are doing this in their forests to try to slow the spread of this disease. But you can imagine, even if you do that work and you have trees in the center, if they're not removed and they have those pressure pads and there's insects that are being attracted to those pressure pads, then you could be moving the, the fungus, the spores on the beetle to trees that are pruned and those trees could not necessarily be pruned but because of ice storm damage or because of some damage that's happened to those trees so in closing i want to bring you back to this invasion species invasive species curve uh, it could be used for fish or anything else but to me this is where we can make the biggest difference in forest dealing with forest pathogens and i've only dealt with a few here today but if we look at again at oak wilt the one we just addressed where we can make the biggest impact in my mind is preventing, making sure that we don't have that disease coming in, even being introduced. That's where our best energy is. Because we already know with white pine, blister rust, and beech bark disease, and American chestnut blight, and butternut canker, with all the rest of those diseases, even though they've been only in Ontario for a short period of time, and yes, blister rust has been here for 100 years, but those others have been here for less than 50 years. If we look at where we are right now, we're really up there on local control and management only. And then with some of those diseases, they've gotten away from us. You know, the cost of control is prohibitive. We haven't found any magic bullets and we're still looking. Uh, those dollars are less and less, but we're still looking for those magic bullets, but we're not finding them. And I'm, I'm afraid with things like diseases like oak wilt, and oak wilt and thousand canker disease. Yes, we don't have the disease yet. Yes, we don't have an introduction. But the detection of them is extremely difficult, extremely expensive. And even when we do get them, if we find them in the introduction and the detection stage, the eradication there, the feasibility of that, I think for pathogens is much lower than what's showing on this graph. And certainly by the time we, the public, become aware of these things where it's pointed out on this graph, it's always way too late for forest pathogens. In fact, a lot of invasive plants, it's, it's a bit too late. And as it says there, Eradication unlikely, you know, intense effort required, and maybe even with intense efforts, we can't do that. So with that, I hope um, I've enlightened you a little bit with some of the diseases that we're facing in Ontario and other parts of Canada. And uh, I really like you to take this message of the invasive species curve home with you, if you haven't seen this, and really think of where we're concentrating our efforts in dealing with some of these invasive forest pathogens. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was a very interesting presentation on the threats posed by invasive pathogens on Canada's forests. Um, we do have a couple minutes left for questions, so if anybody has a question for Richard, you can enter it now into the side panel of the GoToWebinar program. Uh, Richard, the first question I have for you here 
If Oakwilt is uh, so close to Ontario and such a threat, what is Ontario doing to manage or prepare for this threat? Well, one of the things that we're doing is um, certainly trying to get the word out there with um, to the public. But one of the things that we're actually doing is we're doing our first Oakwilt survey with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So this summer we'll be initiating our first survey ever. And I think that's our a good first step. So we know it's close. As far as we know, it's not in Ontario. But if it is there, hopefully our survey will uh, be able to pick that up. And um, we'll just have to wait and see if, if, um, if we're going to find something. I, I think the big thing, though, um, is really education and informing people of some of these things that are coming. And I think we're, we're doing that as well. Uh, the next question here, Will, won't trees with some resistance over time repopulate the forest with pathogen-resistant offspring? Yes, um, that, that's very true, and that's what we're hoping will happen with beech, uh, with beech trees. So where we have that, those resistant trees that are showing uh, resistance, that 1 to 4% that we're seeing in the population in some locations, we're hoping that that's going to help, and of course with some genetic help, like helping those trees meet each other and cross-pollination. So there is a lot of hope for beech to do that. And that's basically what we're trying to do with a lot of these species that, um, you know, even with American chestnut is looking for those resistant trees, not necessarily always crossing them with other hybrids. But um, yeah, so I think there is possibility to do that. But that takes a lot of energy and a lot of resources. And I'm not sure that we're really there yet with a lot of species. So, you know, American Chestnut Foundation and the Ontario or the Canadian Chestnut Foundation is putting a lot of work into that, but they haven't had any really magic moments. And even with Dutch elm disease, uh, there's a lot of work going on in the United States looking for resistant trees, and there's some promise there, um, but there's still time yet to see if the proof's in the pudding. And that's because they haven't been, the, the things that they've developed, the product they've developed, hasn't been around long enough to be fully tested. So Richard, are trees in the urban areas less susceptible to these diseases and pathogens or do they mostly impact natural areas? No, these invasive species are pretty well found everywhere. And um, certainly, you know, we don't have large populations of beech in a lot of urban areas, but I do know of people who have a single beech tree with beech bark disease. And we get lots of calls um, with people with white pine blister us not knowing what it is on a one or two trees in a, an urban property. So very, very common. And, um, and these things, um, you know, they're pretty well naturalized in many cases. Uh, so you mentioned that white pine blister rust has been in North America for almost 100 years. So do we still consider this an invasive species since it's been here so long? Or how long do you think it will have to be here before we consider it natural or native to the landscape? Mm -hmm. Hi, Simon. That's a, that's a really good question. And um, I like to think that we're going to consider this one to be an invasive species for a while because it's costing us a great deal of money to manage. And, um, you know, like some species, when we have um, Norway maple, I think we can say they're naturalized because they're not doing a lot of damage. And, uh, you know, though some people don't like Norway maple and there's some municipalities that are saying tear them out. I think when we're dealing with some of these forest pathogens and even insect pests that cost us resources and we're fighting, I think, um, We'll, we'll call them uh, invasive species for a while yet. So is there any hope for a breeding program used against white pine, white pine blister rust? Yeah, um, there's a lot of work going on with that. In fact, there's quite a bit of work here going on at OFRI, the Ontario Forest Research Institute with, um, with Pi Jing Lu, a scientist who's done lots of breeding and looking for resistance. Um, there's been lots of work done with crossing, so hybridization with other um, white pine and there's some success with that but uh, I think we're a long way and of course the geneticists will say we need to do a lot more with the population genetics once we get those trees so the verdict's still out with that and of course there's lots of uh, questions for the public to accept those trees but I think there's a lot of promise and of course if we don't do the work we won't know about that but one thing I will say um, with the breeding programs and other things there's uh, some new work coming out with endophytic fungi so using endophytic fungi to uh, prevent infection from taking place. And just briefly, endophytic fungi are trees that show no signs, or trees that are showing no signs of symptoms of disease because they have a fungus already in them that's um, antagonistic to white pine blister rust. So again, um, 
There's some work being done in Canada where we're trying to inoculate trees. We're putting this fungus in. Inoculate means put it in and put a lot more of that on the trees. That's a native path or fungus. It's not a pathogen, a fungus that's being used. And what we're hoping is that this will protect the trees from other pathogens like white pine blister rust from coming in. Can you list a few diseases outside of North America that are a threat for introduction or establishment into Canada? Yeah, I think, that, thank you for that question. Was this a setup? Um, that that question is a really good question. And I think the closest one that we have are actually two. The first one is oak wilt that I talked about today. And I think that's why uh, there's such an interest with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in Ontario to do a survey for this and to get prepared. Because um, I think we're, we're going to see this, if not this year or the next few years, uh, shortly because it's spreading in the United States. It's very close in Michigan, and it's spreading southward too. Uh, it's certainly a big issue in Texas. The other one I think that I'm concerned about is thousand canker disease of black walnut. And that one um, has spread. It, it's a bit controversial, that one, because in the United States, they considered it to be an invasive species initially. It's found down in the southwestern part of the United States, um, where it's deemed now that the, the insect vector is, is native, and the fungus is still a little bit disputed, but it's it might be native down in southwestern United States, down by the Mexico border, if you like. But when it moved up into the eastern part of North America, into the Black Walnut Range, and it's a long story, where it's now found in, in five states, um, and it's expanding, and certainly into the walnut industry, they're concerned. Now, in Ontario, we're concerned because we don't have a lot of butternut, but we're concerned about our biodiversity I mentioned before. And the other aspect that we know with thousand canker disease, it, another host is, is um, butternut. And butternut is in the jugland family, and it's very closely related. So I think those two are the, the two highlights for Ontario. Uh, there are certainly some that are in, in Europe, but they're a long way away yet. And I think uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency has that well in hand to help prevent the establishment. So doing that work that I'm saying that's not on that curve, so way, way down before it gets here, uh, is where we should be working. Okay, another question here on beech bark disease. So do any forestry guides prohibit the removal of resistant beech trees from the forest to ensure that the resistant population remains? No, there's nothing along that way uh, in Ontario or any other jurisdiction. Um, we're, we're trying to educate people about that. And one of the reasons uh, I, I think this is a, a really good question and a terribly important question is because we made some forest pathologists and society in the past has made some big mistakes. And one of the big mistakes I think is with American chestnut blight or dealing with American chestnut trees with chestnut blight. And back then when chestnut blight came into North America around 2000, uh, 1994 into New York, into New York in the uh, Arboretum there, the New York gardens, botanical gardens, and it spread out. And it, it was very fast, very devastating disease, very much like butternut canker in my mind, where it killed trees very, very quickly and um, spread across North America. And one of the big concerns with that is that people were, were cutting those trees down willy nilly, really quick, get the wood while they could. And what they didn't do is consider what we're now considering is, are the trees showing resistance? Are the trees showing some kind of fight to this? And because people weren't thinking that way then, and they didn't know, and they didn't have the science, and they didn't do the work, I guess, they removed a lot of those trees that might have been showing tolerance or resistance. Now we have that information. I think it, we have to be very prudent that we do protect those trees, but it's also difficult to find those trees. So as I said, in the aftermath forest where the diseases pass through, it's easier. And, and, but should we be doing this? Yes. Should there be some kind of regulation with it? Um, that's a tough question, and, but a good question. I'll leave it for another discussion. Okay, so just following up with uh, the resistant beech tree population, is there a breeding program to work on uh, bringing out this resistance? Uh, we don't have anything in Canada that I'm aware of, but I do know down in the States, there, there is a, a, a program being led by the U.S. Forest Service right now, and um, they're, they're working on this, that issue. I think it's something that we still have some time in Ontario, uh, because it's not through our range, but it's certainly something we should be considering. Okay, well, we've run out of time for questions here. So on behalf of everyone, I would like to thank Dr. Richard Wilson for joining us today and giving us some insight into the world of invasive forest pathogens. 
I encourage everyone to register for our final webinar, which will be held uh, next Thursday, May 7th at 1 p.m. Next week, we will hear about invasive forest plants. These invaders can spread across the forest floor, choking out native species and altering ecosystem dynamics. Learn how to take action and control the spread of invasive forest plants. Our speaker next week will be Rochelle Gagnon, who is the program coordinator at the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. Thank you to everyone who logged on today to view our presentation. You can visit our website at www.forestinvasives.ca for more information and to register for the last webinar in the series. I hope to see you all back here next Thursday. Thank you and have a great afternoon.